Good morning and welcome to worship at Calvin Presbyterian Church. We are glad you are with us this morning. My thanks to those who are leading in, us in worship today, to Mark Bilyeu, our Director of Music, to Pam Van, Van Devecti, who is our liturgist, to Miles Herr and Kylie Hazelton, who are our vocalists, and finally to Joel Wenz, who is our videographer. Today is Reformation Sunday, which is always the last Sunday in October. This day marks the beginning, of course, of the Protestant Reformation when in 1517 Martin Luther posted his 95 complaints on the church door in Wittenberg. In the Presbyterian Church, we look to Luther, but also to other reformers who followed him to John Calvin, the namesake, of course, of this church, and John Knox, whose work was in Scotland. Apart from being theologians and preachers, several of the Reformation leaders were also musicians. Calvin is often known for encouraging the singing of psalms alone in worship, but our first hymn is actually attributed to John Calvin. We'll, we'll hear Martin Luther's most favorite and familiar hymn later in the service, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. God walks the pathways of both light and darkness with us. In God's presence, we find both healing and hope. 
God is our home forever. God knows us through and through. May God guide our worship time and open us to how to live with our heart, mind, body, and soul. Please join me in our opening prayer. O God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are with us. You have showered love upon all generations from the beginning of time. Guide now our worship time as we move into the week ahead. Hear us as we sing your praises and call upon your name. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who models the way for us to live. Amen. The 90th Psalm reads like a prayer. Its poetry speaks of the fleeting nature of human life compared with God who is eternal. If there is a conclusion to this prayer, it might be this Psalm. It might be that we make wise use of our time and turn to God in whom we find true purpose and hope for tomorrow. It reminds us that God has always been and will always be with humanity. We tend to focus on the problems we face at this particular moment but the psalmist points to God's presence throughout time. What is unique about this psalm is that it is traditionally associated with Moses, who sought wisdom 
in light of humanity's frailty. Before reading, let us pray. Lord, open our minds to help us understand the Bible. Open our eyes to see the wonderful truths of your instructions and open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that has been renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands.
Scripture reading for today is from Matthew's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 46. Read the Gospels, and you start seeing early on that Jesus is parting ways with the authorities, no matter who they were or what their theological stance. Jesus was forever upsetting the status quo, calling, calling into question things people took for granted. Earlier in this gospel, Jesus had said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Perhaps that's why he is receiving the question that he has asked in this passage. We don't know the motivation of this particular questioner. It might be they hope to discredit Jesus or make themselves look smarter, or perhaps they genuinely wanted to know how to live faithfully. The latter part of this passage shows concern over Jesus' claim of his identity. This passage, the context for it is in the final turbulent week in Jerusalem when tensions were high. By this point in the narrative, Jesus had entered the temple, he had upset the tables of the money changers, and had already had a discussion about whether or not to pay taxes. Now the religious leaders seem to be taking turns, as if they're questioning Jesus in hopes of catching him with something with which they can charge him. In this passage, a Pharisee, one of those leaders whose life work was interpreting the Torah, the laws of Judaism, has a question for Jesus. So listen to the word of God as it comes to us from Matthew 22. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what commandment is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David. How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him. Any more questions? Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. What does it mean to you to be a Christian? What is central to your understanding of the faith? In our country where more and more people have no experience of the church and consider Christmas as a day to give gifts and Easter as a day to have lots of candy, it's probably a question worth considering. Where once in our country most everyone had at least some understanding of the central texts of the Bible, that is no longer so. Nationwide, there is a growing number of people who claim no religious affiliation. The Bible is an undiscovered book for a growing number of adults. Jesus, when asked to choose what was central to the Jewish faith, answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
Now, Jesus was not coming up with a revolutionary idea when he spoke those words. Jesus was not inventing something new. The people listening to him would have known the Hebrew scriptures. They likely also knew that there were countless commands in the scriptures that were to be followed, that there was serious discussion between scholars about which of those commands was most important. Jesus cuts to the chase quickly, reciting the verse known as the Shema, the fundamental creed and prayer in Judaism taken right out of the book of Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then those words that come from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Those verses summarize the Jewish laws. They encapsulated just as much what Jesus had been teaching. Jesus was not saying anything that disagreed with the Hebrew scriptures or with the faith. Jesus was stressing that love of God and self and neighbor is what the faith is all about. I don't think the questioner could have argued that the point of the Jewish law was to orient one life, one's life towards God. To love God is to love as God loves everyone and everything. Love God with all that is in us. There's no distinction for Jesus between love of God and love of neighbor. To love God is to love our neighbor. Love your neighbors reflects our love for God. We are incomplete until we reach out to another. There's a saying in parts of Africa that says, I am a person because of other people. Love God with every fiber of your being and our neighbor as ourselves, and we will be in a good place with God. It's all we need to know to live as faithful people. But what you might ask, wanting a little help with the application part of this, what does it actually mean to demonstrate this love of God and love of neighbor? This being Reformation Sunday, I looked on the Presbyterian Church USA website to see what it might have to say about Reformation Sunday. The website told about one of the reformers named Zwingli. He lived in Switzerland in the early 1500s, where he had been serving a church. In September 1519, there was a new wave of the plague that was devastating Europe, including Zwingli's hometown of Zurich. Zwingli returned in order to begin caring for the sick. I read that an estimated quarter to a half of Zurich's citizens died from the plague, including Zwigli's own brother, Andreas. Consider what we know about pandemics and how quickly they spread. Imagine then a nurse or a first responder working without any protective gear. This was long before there was knowledge of germs and their spread had occurred. Not surprisingly, Zwingli, serving on the front lines of caring for the sick, got sick himself. He was one of the fortunate ones to recover. He went on to write what is called the Plague Song, which is an earnest cry to God for help. It was interesting to me to think of how one of the reformers was living in the midst of another pandemic. But what really stood out for me in Zwingli's case is how even considering the risk that he could very likely die from it, he went to serve the sick and the dying. 
on that same website of the Presbyterian Church USA that told about Zwingli, there was a reference to the General Assembly meeting, the national gathering of our entire denomination that we're part of that took place this past summer, remotely, of course. The website explained that the General Assembly had said churches are to, and I quote here, set aside this year's Reformation Sunday as a day for the whole church to commit to continuous discernment of how to meet the social justice, economic, and spiritual challenges of the pandemic. I suspect Many of us still feel isolated from the devastating effects of the pandemic that we're in. I've been a part of conversations a number of times where people discuss whether anyone even knows someone who has actually been sick with COVID-19. But we surely all know that even if we are living in a protected bubble at this moment, we don't have to look far to find people who are really struggling to make ends meet or who are concerned with good reason about the health of a loved one caused by this pandemic. Jesus made it so clear that God's expectations have always been that we show love for God by caring for one another. So with the strong nudge of the General Assembly and the weekly lectionary that gives us this text, I believe we have to ask, what are we doing? Where are we spending our time and our energies as followers of Christ, as part of a church, the body of Christ? We're all good people, I think. We would all say, oh, of course I love my neighbors. But how are we living out that command just now? How are we getting outside of our own shells, our own concerns, and following Christ's call to care for our neighbors? Faith has never been just about God and me. This is about opening our eyes to the needs of our community, our country, our world. We don't have to look far just now to find needs between the pandemic and the wildfires and the hurricanes and tornadoes, the needs are never far from our sights. How do we live our faith? What do we think is the central work of our life as followers of Christ? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind is what Jesus told us to do, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.
should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, nor God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim, we tremble not for Rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little world shall fail him. That would above all earthly powers, no thanks to them. Let us turn to God in prayer. O God, beyond vision, God, beyond time, compared to you, we are a speck of dust caught in the sunlight. We are here but a moment in the ongoing history of this creation. And yet you reach out to us in love from beyond time and space to embrace us, to guide us. We give you thanks for those people who reflect your image and how to care for one another with love and care. We give you thanks for those who took a chance to bring change to your church. We give thanks for those who have taught us what it means to be a follower of Christ. God of grace, we lift our prayers for those who are struggling with illness and disease, for those facing treatment, for those on the long road to recovery. We pray for those who are mourning, for those who are struggling with issues that get in the way of living life to its fullest. We pray for those people feeling isolated by this time, and we pray for all of us as we long for life to return to normal. Help us focus on what we can do in this time, O oh God, setting aside those things we cannot do. And give us grace, we pray. Give us peace. Give us courage and wisdom. All these things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Go forth into this hurting world with God's love, offering healing, hope, and peace to all. Go in peace, and may God's peace surround you always. Amen.
stay in touch, stay well, stay close to God.